Hi, uh, I'm George Whitesides. I'm the CEO of Virgin Galactic, which is uh, Richard Branson's space company. And it's really nice to meet you remotely here uh, as another uh, space industry colleague um, and look forward to having a conversation with you about your company. Sure. So my name is Peter Platzer. I'm originally a high energy and fusion physicist from Austria. And I'm the CEO and one of the founders of uh, NanoSatisfy. And we are a CubeSat-based nanosatellite company. Uh, and we are building a constellation of CubeSats to provide not only educational experiences, which is, as Vinod Kozla calls it, our base camp, but we are also building a constellation for uh, enterprise data, particularly with regards to large asset tracking, ships, planes, uh, and weather and agriculture. Those are like the markets that we want to focus on particularly. We were founded about um, uh, in September of last year. We had a Kickstarter campaign less than a year ago. And since then, in just 10 months, we built uh, two satellites that are in integration right now at Chaksa for our launch on August 4th. Uh, we have uh, another launch of our third satellite set up for end of November, early December. And believe it or not, I just had started a conversation with Will Pomerantz from you on using Launcher One to launch some of our next satellites. Fantastic, Launcher One being our uh, our, our company's um, new orbital launch vehicle, which is which is absolutely fantastic. Well, that's great. It's really exciting, and you have a you have a background, obviously, in space as well. You've gone to the International Space University and various yeah. other things. Yeah, that is correct. I, I I met I was first at Singularity University in 2009 because I spent like the last 10 years on Wall Street. Um, building quantitative trading um, uh, uh, strategies there. And following exponential technologies closely, I went to the inaugural executive program of the uh, Singularity University in 2009 and had a lot of conversation with Peter Diamandis and Ben Barry. You know, I'm, I'm sure you know uh, all of them pretty well. And it was obvious that there is now you know, a trifactor of forces which is really cracking open the space industry. Uh, some of it is regulatory driven, some of them is driven uh, by technology. And so Peter ended up writing me a letter of recommendation for the International Space University where I did the graduate program. And amongst the whole host of projects there, you know, I was um, a class representative at the top of my class. We ran a, a research study there. Um, I interviewed, I did closed door interviews with uh, space executives, uh, 40, 50 from uh, military, government, um, uh, space agencies, space companies and ask them about nanosatellites, their strategies, their perception, their uses, their budgets, um, and then compare that with what is actually happening with that technology. And having seen the movie, the transition from like the Cray 2 computer that I used at CERN when I was a physicist there to the PC and now the iPhone, I was really, really like reminded of I have seen that transition. I have seen how a non-standard, large, slow technology gets completely disrupted by a quickly updating uh, technology as well as the PC at this point in time. And the very same thing is happening uh, in the space industry with, with very, very large satellites being disrupted more and more with uh, we call small satellites, CubeSat space, which is a standard. And so based on that, we then started the company now satisfied. So I think it's very exciting. And obviously, we are a big believer in um, in uh, in that revolution that you're talking about, where uh, we're finally, uh, you know, the space industry is going to get revolutionized by uh, um, by some of the trends that have been going through the microelectronics industry. So let's let's dive in and let's talk a little bit about um, the business. So um, now it's interesting that you said basically. I, I think what I heard was that um, that you're going to focus in on sort of um, da data comms. Is is that right? I mean, because that was what I was sort of wondering was. You know, you start off in education, and then and that's a that's a great great place to start a foothold. Um, but um, but so, can you talk a little bit more about that application that you see as sort of your first yeah. big business opportunity? So the uh, after the launch of our of our satellites here, the next step for us is is do a Series A um, towards our enterprise data product because I consider myself a data company more than anything else. And the story here is in three years, um, we will know the location, heading, origin, destination of every ship and plane on the planet, and maybe even train. And we will have two orders of magnitudes more weather data points and one to two orders of magnitude lower price point than anything that exists today. 
And so, um, how do you monetize that? Uh, so, on the uh, on the on the ship tracking side, um, there is a number of constituents that are looking for that information. Uh, those are governments um, that want to know if ships are in and out of economic exclusion zones, uh, as well as where they are generally over the ocean. Uh, search and rescue to know which ships are heading to its uh, a dangerous weather um, uh, area or not. There are the, the, the ship companies themselves that would like to know where the ships are. Um, there are ship analytics and vessel tracking systems, VTS companies, um, that purchase this data. Currently, the only way you can get what is called ARS, Automatic Information System Data, is from land-based systems, which on one hand is billions of dollars of infrastructure cost, and the other problem is that it only reaches about 50 miles into the ocean. So you lose track of all that information once you hit the ocean. One of the things that our satellite is doing is that it has also an optical imaging capability that you can fuse with the ARS information to detect pirate ships. Pirates cost about between four and ten billion dollars annually. And one of the biggest problems is, is that we do not have regular tracking of the oceans. And even though there are some companies that are looking at using, you know, three or four satellites to provide space-based ARS solutions, they don't that doesn't give you the revisit time to see a fast pirate ship uh, because you might not see a certain area of the ocean for you know five, six, seven, or eight hours. With a constellation of, uh, of 50 satellites, each satellite at a cost of, call it $100,000, you actually have revisit time in like two to five minutes, which allows you almost like a constant coverage. Yeah, no, it's very exciting. It's very exciting. I, I, I get it. So let's talk about competition. So um, why isn't like Orbcom doing this or uh, Inmarsat or Iridium or whatever? I, I mean, I get how their, their satellites are more expensive, um, but at the same time, they're doing other businesses at the same time. So why can't they sort of incrementally add AIS or other stuff into their into their yeah. business? So Orbcom has been trying for about seven years to do that. Um, their satellites have uh, repeatedly failed, um, so they still don't have a single satellite which is working um, on it. They have now finally one satellite which has an ARS receiver on board. Um, the main problem is, is that they're going to have six, maybe ten satellites. Because the satellites are $100 million birds, they cannot provide the ongoing coverage that you need, for example, to see if a ship is moving. Because you really need to like, have a coverage of the ocean with revisit times of a few minutes and not a few hours. So the first issue that Opcom has is that because the satellites are so large and so expensive, they will never be able to have a, a fleet of 50 satellites. Um, the second problem that Orbcom has is they do not have imaging capabilities on the satellites partially because they are on a much higher orbit. So they can't do the sensor fusion to uh, look, for example, for pirate ships. And the third problem is, is that their satellites being so much higher than ours, their field of view is significantly larger. So their field of view captures significantly more ships at the same point in time. And that is increasing one of the biggest problems in ARS, which is um, a signal collision, which is when you're listening to a number of ships at the same point in time. Um, I don't know how technical you want to get into the ARS story there, but it's a, it's a, it's a time uh, a sequence modulation. And so if you have enough ships, there unfortunately are ships sending at the same point in time on the same frequency, and you have what is called signal collision. So how big is that market? I mean, that specific market? So the, um, the, the ARS market uh, for without any kind of like pirate story is between 100 and $500 million. We've done like, you know, up and down uh, looking at, at the various markets there. The pirate ship detection, which you can do with the sensor fusion of optical imagery and, um, uh, and ARS signal detection, that is a market of the order of about one and a half to two and a half billion dollars. Um. Okay, great. And and um, so I know we've got a limited amount of time left, so I want to cover just a, a two other quick uh, subjects. Uh, and maybe you not so quick, but just, what I want to talk just to make sure that we only talked about ARS. We don't talked about ships. We didn't talk about planes, and we didn't talk about weather. Do you want to quickly cover those, just so that yeah, um, so folks uh, the, who are watching? Yeah. So that? on the on, on on the plane side, um, you got the same problem. There is regulatory mandated a receiver ADSB on a plane. But we lose track of planes over the ocean, and the the annual estimated um, uh, market size for 
providing space-based ADSB to give um, airlines you know, more efficient routing and, and uh, collision avoidance is of the order of $500 million. Once we go to the weather market, we're talking about a market that is anywhere between three and $13 billion. It's very hard to capture that because so far there has been certain infrastructure that has been provided by the US government at the cost of billions of dollars for free, but all those projects are canceled. So I don't know if you're aware of, but the US is losing weather satellite coverage in about 18 months for up to five years because the projects that we had to replace our satellites falling out of the sky literally are canceled. So providing um, a replacement for those government programs as well as an order of magnitude or two orders of magnitude more data input on the weather side has implications for disaster avoidance, disaster monitoring, um, power companies on Earth. Um, there, there's a, a large range of companies um, that are interested in that weather data, and it's only getting more companies being interested in that. Very exciting. So um, let's talk about manufacturing for a bit. Are you planning on doing your manufacturing yourself, or um, are you going to partner with other folks, or how, how are you going to how are you going to do that? So we have from the from the start decided that we don't want to get into the manufacturing of the bus, and we want to buy it from CubeSat companies. So that allowed us to produce our first two satellites in like literally just a few months' time, because we were partnering with Gumspace and we were just acquiring their bus, and we were providing the the payload. So we will always focus on the payload and providing that functional part of the satellite, while all the bus, everything that relates to the bus, we will buy off the shelf. With regards to location, um, one of the things that we're going to take advantage of is that as a half European, half American company, um, we will have manufacturing and design outside of the US, because that opens up the launch market for us significantly broader than if we were an only US company. So we're going to take advantage that we are a young company as compared to an old company, which means that we can truly develop space-related technologies outside of the US, which makes it ITAR free. It means I will not be able to get into the lab, same as, as Bob can't get into the lab of Moon Express, but it allows us to launch those satellites at a significantly broader range of launches like India, Russia, UK, um, as it is easy to do for, um, uh, for US companies. I'm very excited about your company. I think there's huge growth potential for it. Um, and uh, I, I really think that uh, the transformation that's going to be enabled uh, by small satellites in all kinds of uh, service sectors and information sectors is going to be transformational. So um, I wish you the very best of luck. I'm sure you're going to make a lot of money. And uh, look forward to meeting you in person sometime. Uh, me too. Thank you so much for your time, Joe. Really appreciate it.